Our last speaker is uh, Professor Diane Kirkby. Uh, I would like to extend a special thank to Professor Kirkby because uh, she has come a very long way to come here uh, today. And uh, Professor Kirkby is uh, a co-author uh, of this paper with Dr. Alice Garner, who couldn't come to Pisa. Uh, but on behalf of, uh, the, of the scientific committee, I would like to thank uh, very much Dr. Garden for her contribution to this conference. Professor Kirkby uh, teaches North American art and political and cultural history and Australian history at La Trobe University, Melbourne. And uh, the title of her paper is Trailblazers Across the Pacific, the impact of the Fulbright Exchange Program on the development of new academic fields in Australia, 1949-1968. Please, Professor Kirkby. Thank, thank you very you, much. Um, and I'd also like to thank you all for staying to this last session, but I'd also like to particularly thank Andrea and his team for organising this conference and enabling me to make this long journey and my first visit to Pisa. And I'm sorry that Alice, Dr Garner, couldn't be with me. I'm going to shift the focus um, in my paper to um, another part of the world. Um, obviously still talking about America, but um, looking at the Pacific rather than Europe and the North Atlantic. There has been a transformation in the Australian university sector, particularly since the 1980s. Uh, it's not my area of research, um, but I think uh, I've been investigating the Fulbright program and I think we can argue that aspects of um, that transformation really can be traced back to the earlier post-war period. Um, when Australia began to move away from its dependence um, on the UK and the UK model of education, its traditional dependence, its traditional um, establishment of higher education, and it began to look much more to the United States. And what we see is a lot of those people who went to the United States in that period are now the university administrators with the philosophies of education that are coming out of precisely what Simone has just been talking about. Um, so uh, that's also then created some new disciplines. So our paper is uh, examining the way in which um, academics themselves were participating in this process. It's not about government policy, it's not simply about um, top-down administration, but that the mobility of scholars uh, in travelling between countries, um, particularly under the Fulbright program, uh, contributed to these uh, development of new academic fields um, in Australia in the 1950s and 60s. Now, the Fulbright program was um, a bilateral agreement for an international academic exchange program named after its originator in Congress, um, Senator J. William Fulbright, um, who was shocked by his own government's actions at the end of World War II in dropping the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. Um, so he devised this program because he thought, having been a Rhodes Scholar himself, the benefits of international travel would actually be um, a way of uh, widening, expanding American foreign policy but um, a peaceful initiative, a way of building peace in the long term. And the, um, it effectively it put academics, I guess, in the front line of foreign policy, but it wasn't actually State Department policy. Um, the Fulbright program was funded by the government, but unlike other international exchange programs, um, it was also independently administered. So it was a bi-national scheme uh, of merit-based awards, specifically enabling overseas scholars to work in the United States and American scholars to travel abroad. But it was also part of that expansion, that government expansion in higher education that followed World War II. Um, and Australia and countries in the Pacific, Asia Pacific, were the first countries to sign up. 
uh, Australia signed up in 1949. There are always tensions between government or State Department uh, expectations and policies and the Fulbright goals and the independent administration of the Fulbright program and that we can see in our tracing in the administration of the scheme over time. But there are also some unexpected outcomes and that's partly what I'm interested in. So whatever governments think they're doing, sometimes people have their own way of doing something else. So in all, some 2,500 Australians and some 2,000 Americans have participated in the exchange program in the 60 plus years since it began. But our paper is only focusing on the first years to show how choices made then influence the growth of new academic disciplines. Um, and also reoriented the Australian university sector um, so it was influenced by this cultural exchange. The first Australian scholars, some 27 of them, including two women, from 17 different research fields, noticeably weighted towards the sciences in those days, headed across the Pacific in 1950 to 18 different US universities spread across the continent. The first Americans, 23 men and again two women, came to Australia the following year from 19 different universities. The Americans' fields, however, were much more heavily in the social sciences and humanities. And this marked disparity between sciences or humanities waiting led to debates concerning the ideal mix and whether scientists or humanities scholars were better equipped to act as ambassadors, building mutual understanding, which was what Fulbright had wanted, for their respective countries. So although Fulbright scholarships were awarded in every academic field, from the outset there was particular encouragement for scholars in the humanities and social sciences that was consistent with the idea of mutual understanding. Because choosing people and scholars and teachers who could explain their country's history, politics and cultural expression to their hosts was seen to be a better way of doing that. But it was not unaffected by the geopolitics of the world situation. It wasn't until the late 1980s or 90s that efforts were made at the Australian end to attract um, people in the, in the arts, in the performing and visual arts. Um, so numbers of these were very small in the 1950s, but they weren't insignificant because the program records for the 1950s and 60s support what other scholars are finding, which is that the arts were a very significant part of the way the US waged the Cold War, and which Australia was deeply implicated in its alliance, its defence alliance with the United States, which then led it also into the war in Vietnam. Uh, cultural production promoted as material evidence of a flourishing and free intellectual life might offer a psychological advantage in our cultural relations, um, the US Consul General argued in a 1955 dispatch from Sydney. So with the deepening of the Cold War, the promotion of the discipline of American studies became a more explicit focus of US cultural diplomacy efforts. Um, but it proved problematic because in the universities this was still a marginal field. And as in the post-war period when the world was coming to terms with burgeoning US power, many academics saw American studies as an expression of that power rather than as a spontaneously developing and legitimate academic field. And in their 1965 history of the Fulbright program, Walter Johnson and Francis Culligan um, found that American literature, history and government were not yet well known as established disciplines. And even the most authentic offerings were liable to be suspected by faculty, students or the public as being simply propaganda. The Fulbright program was very concerned always not to be seen as a part of American propaganda. So encouraging American studies overseas was high on the agenda of the Board of Foreign Scholarships which administered the Fulbright program and from at least 1951. Um, and the Australian um, Fulbright program was very keen, certainly keen to support scholars in American history and politics and always made sure there was a space in the program for a visiting American 
uh, historian. Um, but it wasn't until the mid-1960s that the Australian and New Zealand American Studies Association was actually founded and American Studies took off. When um, Wisconsin historian Merle Curti, one of the founders of American Studies, uh, American Studies Association in the United States, visited Australia on a Carnegie grant and, and attended the, um, the first Congress um, that was held in Australia. But when the following year he wrote up the history of the formation of the American Studies in Australia, he emphasised the importance of the Fulbright program um, in establishing it, but he failed to mention the resistance and the tensions arising from um, the American government's support for that same American Studies program. So we have to be very careful about the kind of sources that we're reading in terms of writing this history. And today, my own university at La Trobe is known for its strength in American studies, thanks partly um, to the important part played by Fulbright alumni, uh, some of whom served on the Fulbright Selection Committee for many years. Um, the second um, area that was very important um, was um, that I want to focus on was the way that um, while general um, policy was guided by the US-based Board of Foreign Scholarships, um, binational commissions within the countries uh, that were running these programs were able to make decisions about the award selection procedures and programming policies um, responding to local needs. And um, Tracing the field of research emphasised in awards over the first decades reveals these changing national preoccupations so that it's noticeable that the Australian awards were left open um, as to field, partly because of the way things were funded. Um, but, and that meant that Australian scholars needed to find support in the United States. So their success in getting an award wasn't so much dependent on their field, but on their ability to lo locate themselves in America. But the Americans, on the other hand, were required to fall into a range of targeted research and teaching areas that were considered beneficial to Australia. Um, a list that the board also altered slightly from year to year. Um, for example, in the early 1950s, when Australia was first trialling mass immigration or migration from Europe, and much of it came from Italy, I should say, uh, migration assimilation and increased productivity sat high on the list of desired fields for visiting Americans. These were replaced in the early 1960s by mathematics, uh, in which there was perceived to be a crisis in Australian schools and universities, and also then American studies. Um, and by 1965, when a new Fulbright Agreement was in force, Asian and Pacific studies um, became, came in second as the most wanted field um, of American scholars in Australia, which was a telling development in the context of Australian and American military involvement in Southeast Asia and Vietnam. Um, but it was also followed by some new foci, um, mineral resources development, business administration, and advanced management. Um, a harbinger, we think, of the revolutionary economic, environmental, and social transformations that we're seeing today. So although the Board of Foreign Scholarships did not try to determine the fields in which scholars might win awards, um, in order to deal with applicants in what were in Australia then non-academic fields, um, the board also created um, a special categories award in 1955 for fields like nursing and journalism and librarianship and social work, none of which was taught in the British model of uh, Australian universities at that time. Um, but it had the unintended consequence of benefiting many women who worked in these fields, partly because they were outside mainstream universities um, and who would otherwise have missed out. So women in social work, in early childhood education, 
and nursing saw this new opportunity and jumped at it. And so one of the other aspects that's interesting about this program is the changing gender balance of the awards, which is also noticeable. Uh, women's access to Fulbright grants was contingent on, um, oh, that's the, the uh, first American studies meeting in 1964 with uh, Mel Curti. Um, you can see from these statistics that uh, the number of women who were getting awards was always much less than the number of men, but interestingly it also gets worse as time goes on. So it's connected to these beneficial fields. The fields that they're targeting are actually those where women are employed, which is what benefits women. But this is one of the unexpected consequences that I was talking about. Women's access to Fulbright grants was contingent on the terms of the funding, but women also fared better when particular disciplines um, were awarded grants. Um, and their participation was much lower in the older disciplines like law, where the ratio of women to men was 1 to 28 in the 1960s. Um, and in economics, where it was 1 to 16, than it was in these newer emergent um, disciplines. We can also see that um, more Australians went to the United States than came to Australia, but approximately the same proportion are come, are, are of them are women, whether they're American or Australian. So it's always a minority, but it's a significant minority again. The Fulbright program set out to identify and foster academic and intellectual leaders from around the world, and it thereby contributed to widening the pool of talent from which future leaders would be drawn. This not only facilitated the emergence of the United States as a destination for future Australian educators, increasingly replacing British universities, it also created a new cohort of women for whom intellectual and cultural leadership across a range of disciplines was facilitated and indeed became a reality. So in 1960, when Australian historian Jill Kerr Conway arrived at Harvard University to pursue postgraduate study, she became representative of the potential for change that the Fulbright program could bring. Within a year of her arrival, Conway had chosen US women as the subject of her history dissertation, and 15 years later, she was the first woman appointed president of Smith College an all-women's college whose distinctive character Conway then successfully fought to retain, as the pressures to go co-educational mounted. But not only then did her own life change, so consequently would the lives of other women, as Conway pursued the feminist aspirations of women's education. Conway's subsequently distinguished career as an educator and academic in the newly emergent field of women's history is exemplary, um, as it captures other changes in higher education that followed as women used the availability of the Fulbright Award Scheme to pursue their individual goals and to create even more new areas of academic study. Um, Although it is fair to say, therefore, that Fulbright support for women academics was initially inadvertent, it nonetheless was fostering careers among a group of women who used their award to promote the benefits to other women. These women saw possibilities for the advancement of women's careers under the auspices of the Fulbright scheme uh, and were perhaps encouraged to go to the United States because women were a larger minority on university campuses there than they were in Australia and more of them had gained PhDs. Um, another example of um, this kind of um, career benefit is um, Ruth uh, Latukafu, who was studying anthropology at New York University with Margaret Mead uh, in 1958. Um, she went on a three-week Quaker-organised seminar with other foreign students from every continent where difficult political issues of the day were discussed and she remembers that this was a transformational time for her, grappling with big world issues and taking on leadership roles, but with both men and women as intellectual leaders, something that she hadn't experienced at home. 
So Australian women who benefited from the Fulbright scheme did so not because the scheme was conceived with an equal opportunity agenda, but because it had an agenda of actively developing areas of study that had not been part of the British model of higher education, which then dominated Australian universities. Our research so far has concentrated on only a small proportion of the women who travelled between Australia and the US under the auspices of the Fulbright program. Nevertheless, we've been able to show that the opportunity for study and the international travel that the awards offered gave women a means to access, as Whitney Waltney has found as of her study of France, um, educational and social opportunities that were often closed to them at home, which then in turn opened up new career paths, fostered women's creativity and helped create new disciplines like nursing and kindergarten teaching in uh, universities. Um, the Fulbright scheme, scheme did, we are arguing, contribute to altering the landscape of Australian academic study in this unexpected way. And the American women who came to Australia were also trailblazers in their fields. The first American woman to travel to Australia on a Fulbright Award was Harriet Creighton, who was the Professor of Botany at Wellesley College, the first woman to be appointed Secretary of the Botanical Society of America. Another pioneer was Mary Murphy, Professor of Economics and Business Administration at the Los Angeles State College of Applied Arts and Science, the first woman in the United States to become a certified public accountant, and she was not followed by another woman in that role for 20 years. She was the first woman to address the International Congress of Accountants in London and the first Fulbright lecturer in accounting to go to Australia and possibly anywhere in the world. For most, these American women on Fulbright Awards brought with them to Australia ideas and experiences that challenged the status quo, and they showed women carving out new expanded career opportunities. In doing so, they also upended some old traditions. When US historian Donna Merrick arrived from Wisconsin to teach the at the University of Melbourne in the late 1960s, she found it stuffy and alienating. Australian universities were heavily dependent on British academic models of scholarship and networks, and only slowly was this being undermined by a turn towards the United States. And Merrick was among those who drove this shift as she joined with a group of historians who transformed the methods of studying history in what is now called the Melbourne School. I don't know if you're familiar with it. So, um, in conclusion, um, undoubtedly the United States funding organisations like the Fulbright Program um, helped transform educational institutions, academic programs, arts infrastructure and library services in Australia in the key decades of the mid 20th century. And while it is our hypothesis that the US exchange was instrumentally important in reorienting Australian tertiary education, we are not proposing that this was a simple or crude model of Americanisation because, as I've demonstrated or explained, there was a great deal of resistance to that idea within Australia, where anti-American feeling was very strong, particularly again during the Vietnam War years, and it was very uncomfortable for a lot of those Americans who came on Fulbright programs to Australia. As one young postgraduate said, it was not a good time to be an American. Um, we're arguing that rather it was a more complex interplay of ideas and associations, of networks and influences, of training, of curriculum development, of interpersonal connections. There were also subject to disruptions and the timing of larger events unfolding socially and politically in the world stage. Uh, and that's obviously too much to go into in a short conference paper. This paper has simply opened a window onto specific aspects of this cultural exchange between Australia and the United States. And in a larger project, we are exploring the meaning and significance of the Fulbright program in a broader context of Australia's subsequent social and cultural history. And of course, always we are keeping gender at the forefront. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kirkby, for your very important paper, which has allowed us to have a glimpse uh, uh, of a very distant but important uh, uh, university system uh, under a transnational perspective, I should say. Okay, thank you very much.